Hi, I'm Ruth Marcus, and it's only Thursday, the Washington Post Opinions Roundup. This week, a Christmas miracle for the wealthiest, wealthiest Americans and lumps of coal for the rest. Yes, that's the Republican tax bill in a nutshell. Plus, meddling in the Mueller probe and an alt-right purge on Twitter. And, as you know, it's only Thursday. We've got a full house today. Molly Roberts is a post-partisan blogger and digital editor. She'll be bringing in your comments, so please give us something to talk about. Joanne Armeo is an editorial page writer, and Quinta Jurassic is an editorial page contributor. So, just to get us off on a cheery note, let's start with the worst piece of domestic policy legislation in my lifetime, the Republican tax bill. Let's listen. We broke every record. It's the largest, I always say the most massive, but it's the largest tax cut in the history of our country. I have a whole list of uh, accomplishments that the group behind me have done in terms of this administration and this Congress, but uh, you've heard it before. Records all over the place. We have companies pouring back into our country, and that means jobs, and it means really the formation of new, young, beautiful, strong companies. So that's President Trump at the White House Wednesday, celebrating his legislative victory with congressional Republicans. So Republicans were celebrating. Democrats said they were celebrating, too, not because they were happy with the tax bill. They weren't, um, but because they think it's going to be a good um, cudgel for them to bang Republicans with. Uh, at the elections next year. So what do you guys think? Is this good news? Uh, this is pure, pure, crass politics, okay? Not on the merits of the tax bill, which TM Ruth Marcus, the worst. Uh, okay, here goes Joanne again. <laughs> <laughs> Joanne, well, would you like to discuss the pass-through mechanisms embedded in the tax no, we'll bill? No, we'll, okay. we'll, 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 we'll talk the politics. Who, who are the winners and losers? Well, you know, last time I was on here, I said that my eyes glaze over when you talk about the tax bill. And I suspect I'm not alone as Americans. And so I think it's going to be a wash. I think that, you know, next time this year, um, I think that there's going to be talking points on both sides. And Lord knows, with given the, what is happened with the rush of events and how unpredictable things are, we're probably going to be talking about something else next year. So what do you guys think? When, who, who wins politically with this tax bill? I think a win for the Democrats. The messaging around it is just so bad right now, and nobody's going to even see anything happening to their taxes until after the midterm election. So if we're talking who wins in the midterms, I think the Democrats can probably ride this wave for a while. And my understanding is that though maybe eight in ten Americans' taxes are going to go down, they're not going to go down all that much. They'll see maybe a 2% increase in after-tax income. So even if when we're talking when people see that, that's so little that historically people haven't even really noticed. I don't think the Republicans get much out of that. That was a little bit President Obama's uh, right. perspective. Right, 2009 when, when, stimulus. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. Uh, Quinta, you're the tiebreaker. <laughs> sure. I mean, I actually think that Joanne's point about how people sort of don't understand taxes, perhaps viscerally, you know, we didn't, we saw outrage, but we didn't see the same wave of outrage that we saw over the failed health care bill, that it's conceivable that that could actually play in the Democrats' favor. As Molly says, many Americans, even most are getting a tax cut for at least some period of time from this bill, but the perception overwhelmingly right. seems to be that this is a tax cut only for the rich. Um, that is true to an extent, and that it's the tax cuts for the rich that will last over time, whereas the others will expire. But the Democrats have actually been very successful in messaging the bill so people think that they're not getting a tax cut, even if they are. And I think that may have something to do with the fact that it's really confusing. So yeah. if, you, if the two of you are right, um, which you might be, I guess we'll find out in a year. Um, we can come back, ha have a little reunion. Why are, were the Republicans so giddy? Because they got something done, finally. And they got headlines saying, you know, Trump got his first big win. It shows how, what you can have with, you know, the, co the co well, Republicans' control of everything. Um, because they were just focused on that and not on what 
really mattered. But if it's but if it's going to be if you if your big win is something that people are going to hate you for doing, it's not such a win. Well, uh, I think I think this is the point where the sort of crass political calculus breaks down, right? Because it's true in the long run, it's really hard to say right now whether it's going to be a wash, whether or not people are going to, you know, fall in love with this thing, whether they're going to hate it. But what it really comes down to, I would say is that the Republican Party in Congress really believes that this is good policy. It's frankly beyond me why they think that. Um, and Do I think they? beyond <laughs> many economists, but they're really ideologically committed to cutting taxes for the wealthy. And this was a policy priority, and oh, they feel that the they should class, push it through. But whatever. Well, there we go. Yeah, a techni technical difference. Well, let me give my answer, which I think is. It's a little bit Armeo-esque in the sense that who wins and who loses doesn't actually really depend on precisely what's in this tax bill, gasp. It depends on what happens in the, with the economy in the next year. Yeah. And so uh, because now Trump and the Republican Party own it all. They own the economy. They own health care. Trump let it slip. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> I'm having a big press conference that, oh, we've dismantled Obamacare in this tax bill. Not really, but certainly laid some poison pills with Obamacare and taking away the penalty um, involving the, the requirement that uh, you have an individual mandate to purchase health insurance. So now, whatever happens with the economy, whether it's as a result of the tax bill or not as a result of the tax bill, whatever happens with premiums, this, this is all on Republicans. So if things go well, the tax bill was a great boon for them. If things go badly, the tax bill was a disaster for them to pass, having nothing to do necessarily with what's inside it. And what happens if they come back next year and cut entitlements, Social Security? How, who does that help or hurt? Well, okay. The Republican Party has a capacity to delude itself that the answer to all <laughs> ills, the economy is, there's the, the surplus is too large, let's cut taxes. The surplus is evaporated and the deficit's too large, let's cut taxes. Even this Republican Party is not going to take on Social Security or Medicare, I would say, in an election year. And without, by the way, any Democratic support because Democrats aren't exactly inclined to go along with Republicans on things these days. So I think they're, um, we've heard a lot of talk without details about welfare reform. I think what they're more likely to be doing is to be kind of going after these quite hardish to find shiftless lazy folks who are supposedly lying yeah. around collecting welfare checks. They'll tighten, they'll try to tighten up on food stamps, they'll try to tighten up on social security disability, but you're not going to see them going after the, the big enchilada entitlement programs. One thing that I find interesting is how well the Democrats have held together on this and the fact that you have Democrats in red states um, who basically think it's in their interest to go against this. I think is another indicator, which argues against my position that this is a wash. I under, I acknowledge that. <laughs> what do you guys think? Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the fact that the Democrats have held together so well on this is really striking. Um, what I've been struck by is there was some reporting well before this bill about how Democrats were kind of unsure what to do politically, whether they should be attacking Trump or whether they should be attacking congressional Republicans because, you know, the party isn't really cohesive right now. Yeah. There are lots of different well, factions. And what this bill has done is made it a piece of cake to tie them both together and say Trump and the congressional Republicans are one and the same. You and go after one, you go after yeah. both. Look look to um, television screens near you in uh, before the November elections to see some of the shots of exactly. Republicans celebrating yesterday might not be in Republican ads. All right. Now, but, and can, because Joanne gets bored with taxes, if we talk about them for too long. Not the politics. I like uh, the politics. Shifting gears to special counsel Robert Mueller's investigation of Russian election meddling. If Fox is your only news source, well, you might not be listening to this, but you're also probably stocking up on canned food and prepping for the coup that Fox says Mueller is plotting. Let's figure out what we should be worrying about. We start with breaking news. Another glaring example of political bias at your Department of Justice. The fix was in against Donald Trump from the beginning, and they were pro-Hillary. They can't possibly be seen as objective or transparent or even-handed or fair. The investigation was weaponized to destroy his presidency for partisan political purposes. 
and to disenfranchise millions of American voters. Now, if that's true, we have a coup on our hands in America. It's absolutely ludicrous. Strzok is at the center of all this. And if Strzok is the person who prepared this application, everything else is fruit of the poisonous, poisonous tree. tree. I was just going to say that. So it's the higher ups that reputations are uh, under assault, not the, not the line agent. Is the integrity of the agency in question then now? Of course it is. Okay, Quinta. <sighs> What, what are these people smoking? That's a great question, and I, I really don't have the answer <laughs> to that. I mean, I, I don't know, but it really makes you paranoid. <laughs> I think what's, what's interesting about this is that there was a sort of wave of worry on, among Democrats and on the left that Trump was planning to fire Mueller. Um, the, the meme was sort of that it was going to happen, you know, in the run up to Christmas when everyone is out of town. I think that has ebbed a little because uh, the White House has said repeatedly, we're not going to fire Mueller, we're not going to fire Mueller. But what we have seen happen, and what I think is quite clear, is that there's a coordinated effort by Fox and by congressional Republicans to discredit the investigation as much as humanly possible. Um, they've done this by going after Peter Strzok who uh, was detailed to Mueller's probe, then was removed from it after it was discovered that he had sent anti-Trump text messages during the election when he was investigating Clinton. We've seen it in uh, Representative Trey Gowdy's sort of ominous hinting that there's some wrongdoing on the part of Deputy FBI Director um, Andrew McCabe, though Gowdy has failed to provide any real evidence of that. I suspect because there is none. Um, and we've seen it also in attacks on other members of Mueller's team, like Andrew Weissman, who uh, donated to Democratic candidates and spent election night uh, at Hillary Clinton's party. And sent uh, laudatory emails to now fired Acting Attorney General Sally Yates after she stood up against the uh, Trump travel ban. Yes. Well, so they've, there's a little bit of that, you know, if you're going to be paranoid, it doesn't necessarily mean they're not out to get you. Is there, is there anything that you guys have seen that makes you nervous at all about the conduct of the Mueller investigation? Not so. I mean, not so far. I mean, the the, you know, the Texas, you know, they're questionable, they're disturbing. But you know, the basic question that that begs a basic question, which is that if the FBI really wanted to help out Hillary Clinton, why not just leak the fact that Trump was under investigation? Why? That's it. Yeah, that's sort of, or that if they did, wanted it, if, that demolishes the whole theory. If the goal was to help out Hillary Clinton, maybe don't send a letter to Congress several days before the election. Or not to have the director mm -hmm. trash her um, in the press conference breaking well, the FBI protocol. Well, that was, you know, as we all now know, that was totally watered down. Um, it's really disturbing to me that a, an actual network is peddling this extreme and unfounded an argument and alarming a lot of people who aren't going to have the external background because we get our news through these siloed things to believe it. I wonder what the consequence is for, I mean, even if there is no basis for getting nervous about the Mueller probe, I wonder what the consequence is going forward. Molly? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's just something we've seen with the Trump administration generally, so many Democratic norms being undermined, and this investigation is a big threat to him, so he's targeting it right now. But it's no surprise. It's part of a pattern. We have a thought from a reader also um, from Facebook. Reader, watcher, reader, viewer, viewer, whatever you are, Facebook hello. user. Yeah. Uh, this is Gail Sinibaldo Hoffman, who says, we should worry that Trump is not going to fire Miller but Rosenstein, and then replace him with someone else who will fire or shut down the Mueller investigation with some made-up reasons. What do you guys think about that? More likely, less likely? Right, so there have been reports recently that Trump is unhappy with Rosenstein, that he sees him as weak. Rosenstein, of course, is the person who was integral in the firing of Comey, um, and then perhaps to atone for his sins, appointed Robert Mueller and has been very forceful recently in front of Congress um, saying, you know, I really, I don't think that I've, I've seen good cause to dismiss Mueller because of course Rosenstein is the only person who would have the power to do so. And he needs good cause to do and, it. Right, right. And, and under the existing regulations, he would have to find, right. you know, evidence of misconduct, some kind of misbehavior. And he's been very consistent. So Trump is pretty clearly raging against Rosenstein 
for called that him reason. A Democrat. Called him a Democrat. He's not. He's not a Democrat. Yeah. He's a Republican. Um, as is Mueller. <laughs> as is Mueller. Exactly. So look, I mean, I suppose. Trump could fire Rosenstein, and then one of two things would happen. Um, Associate Attorney General Rachel Brand could sort of be bumped up to fill Rosenstein's position. I think there's a lot of evidence that she also would not be willing to fire Mueller on Trump's whim. Or Trump could conceivably try to do an end run around Brand by appointing someone to fill Rosenstein's spot under a statute called the Vacancies Reform Act. Um, I I don't I doubt that Trump would really yeah. do that. It seems frankly overly complicated for him. He tends to act on a whim when he's angry. He sort of lashes out and does things. The amount of planning that would be required to get rid of Rosenstein in a way that would actually be beneficial for Trump is just strikes me as way beyond so there's, him. But, but as long as we're going to engage in these fun hypotheticals, there's another way, um, viewer, that <laughs> Trump could do this, which is you don't have to get rid of Rosenstein. You can kind of get rid of that attorney general, make him go away. Then you get in a new attorney general or appoint, I guess, you're the expert on the Vacancies Act, Quinta, I'm not, um, get somebody in an acting capacity who wouldn't be as uh, Attorney General Sessions is recused, so then that gets that that notorious Democrat Rod Rosenstein um, <laughs> out of the picture. We're going to just spin out a gazillion. Well, I, just, I think you're overthinking this. Here. My view is is that if Trump wants to get rid of him, he'll figure out a way to do to it. get rid of Mueller. Yeah, uh, you know you're overthinking I'm, it. And when you say I doubt that he will do that, those are words I will never say. I doubt President <laughs> Trump right. will do that. And no. yeah, and I'm a little surprised anything. that you were so uh, calm about serene about that. Concept because obviously Senator Mark Warner, um, we're going to hear from him in just a second, not actually here, but on tape, um, took to the Senate floor the, uh, just yesterday and w with a warning shot because he is um, anxious about the notion that the president might do one of two things um, get rid of Mueller or start to issue pardons. Right. Um, so maybe that is the perfect segue. Because I've already said these words, Virginia Senator Mark Warner took to the Senate floor Wednesday to address, address the growing attacks on Mueller. So let's listen to what he had to say to say Quinta shouldn't be so calm. <laughs> Firing Mr. Mueller or any other of the top brass involved in this investigation would not only call into question this administration's commitment to the truth, but also to our most basic concept, rule of law. It also has the potential to provoke a constitutional crisis. Congress must make clear to the president that firing the special counsel or interfering with his investigation by issuing pardons of essential witnesses is unacceptable and would have immediate and significant consequences. So guys, what would happen? Would this Republican Congress stand up to the president? They were all lavishing with praise just yesterday? I'm not betting my uh, Christmas money on it. <laughs> I think with the pardons, that might be a better move for Trump. Wait until they pin down Jared Kushner, maybe, and then pardon him, then firing Mueller straight out. I think that it's more likely the Republicans would rise up if he fired Mueller than if he issued pardons. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the problem is that if Trump were either to try to fire Mueller or to issue pardons, you run up against the problem that neither of those things is necessarily illegal. They may be impeachable, but those are different can, things. Can you explain that? For example, the right. Constitution gives the president the full power to pardon. Exactly. So how right. could possibly, she says in mock horror, <laughs> the um, pardoning that nice Jared Kushner, if it came to that, how could that possibly be an impeachable offense? Well, so the argument would be that, first off, I should say, there's there's a lot of debate over whether or not if the president, say, if the president pardons Jared Kushner hypothetically to, you know, with the intent of covering up some terrible crime, um, there's a debate over whether or not that could constitute obstruction of justice, which is a criminal offense. Setting that aside, um, the argument would be that there's a difference between a crime and an impeachable offense. If the president, you know, gets in his car and runs a red light, 
I don't think we would say that would be impeachable. Um, the example that the legal theorist Charles Black gave is that if the president decided that he didn't like being the president and moved to Saudi Arabia and you know lived in a mansion and didn't do anything, that's not a crime, but it would be impeachable because he's not honoring he his oath of office. Kind of has to do your job. Exactly. So the argument would be that um, issuing a pardon with the intention of prevent of sort of holding himself above the rule of law would be so far outside the bounds of acceptable behavior for a president that it would be impeachable. I think Molly's right, though. I th we are right in what you just said. And Molly's right in the sense that issuing these pardons is yeah. more likely, in my view, than firing Mueller directly. But I think you're wrong. I would disagree on one thing, which is if you're going to pardon him, do it soon. Do it before he's indicted, before you know what, because you can issue the yeah. pardon at any time. Um, and you know, what? it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas, as they say, <laughs> and we're not having a war on it anymore. So I'm, I'm leaving town on Saturday, and I'm a little nervous about you it. you got to get something for your son-in-law. Yeah. What if there well, he doesn't what, have what a if stocking. Possible, <laughs> Hanuk is over. <laughs> what if possible offenses against Kushner were state charges or state? Well, and is that going to, like, undercut the president's ability to pardon him? Yes and So, no. yes. So uh, the president can only pardon federal crimes. So currently, as far as we know, there was only a federal investigation, but there have been reports that Mueller is looking into or is pardoning with New York Attorney General Eric Schneiderman, who would have jurisdiction over anything done in Manhattan, Trump Tower. Um, and so you could imagine a scenario in which if Trump did decide to pardon Kushner, since we're picking on Jared, um, <laughs> that Mueller could then kick the case to Eric Schneiderman, who could then bring state charges against him. Well, it'll give us something to talk about either way. And speaking of something to talk about, finally, Twitter's alt-right purge. New policies rolled out this week aimed to reduce hateful and abusive content on Twitter. Good luck with that. The company <laughs> didn't say it's targeting far-right groups, but you can read between the lines. It defines hate imagery as logos, symbols, or images whose purpose is to promote hostility and malice against others based on their race, religion, disability, sexual orientation, or ethnicity slash national origin. So, sh does this make us, Molly, does this make us feel good about Twitter in terms of trying to make it the Twitterverse a nicer, safer place? Or does it make us feel nervous about Twitter in terms of squelching our freedom of s nasty speech? Well, it depends on the us here. Um, it makes me feel pretty good about Twitter. I think that Twitter rightly got a lot of flack, especially after the violence this summer in Charlottesville, when that was organized largely on the platform. And when we've seen for years people getting harassed on Twitter, I think that these guidelines getting rid of these people and sending them somewhere else, they're still going to have somewhere to speak, is going to make Twitter a better place to be. And if we're talking about speech, it might end up helping out some people who are afraid to speak because they're afraid of this kind of harassment that people have gotten away with for far too long. So I'm happy. Somebody disagree with Molly. Well, I, I'm not going to disagree with her. I mean, there are legitimate, you know, First Amendment concerns. And hate speech, I mean, there is an argument to be made that hate speech is, you know, that there's some protections for that. But overall, I think that I'm with Molly, which is that I think that we, that Twitter went too far in just basically they took no responsibility um, for their, uh, for their, for their content. And they have to start, you know, acting more responsible as a, as a publisher in terms of curating things that have a harmful effect on the social discourse. And I, just to well, be clear, people are still allowed to say on Twitter something very general, like Jews are bad. You know, or I hate Jews, whatever. Happy Hanukkah. <laughs> exactly. Happy Hanukkah. Well, it's over now. Um, but Twitter already had policies against targeted harassment. What this does is it folds hateful imagery into those targeted things, but the images can still exist on Twitter behind a warning wall if they're not directly targeted at someone. So if you just put a swastika up, maybe there'll be a warning on your tweet with a swastika in it that says, you know, this could be offensive, but then you can click and see it. Um, and then the other thing it does is it focuses on these violent groups. And it says if you're affiliated with one of these groups on or offline, that's when your account is going to be suspended. I 
can see some difficulty in figuring out exactly what these groups are and what it means for someone to be affiliated with them. People have pointed out already Richard Spencer, David Duke, still on the platform, the leader of Britain First, whose account Trump used to retweet those anti-Muslim videos, got kicked off. So it's going to be a difficult process. But I think that Twitter is still allowing plenty of room for saying hateful things when there doesn't seem to be a threat coming from them. And I mean, what, ha what happens to the retweeters? such as our president. Is he at risk? Our president is a whole other story because our president... <laughs> Indeed he is. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Our president is a, a state actor and different policies are going to govern. So with military and government figures, we're talking about incitement of violence here. President Trump tweets fire and fury on North Korea and, or someone in the military tweet something about some military operation, right? Even if that has to do with violence, Twitter's not going to get rid of that. There's a newsworthiness component of that, and then there's also a component of just this is part of these people's jobs and what they have to do every day. And Quinta, are you comfortable with Twitter's policy I'm, or nervous I'm, about I'm, it? I'm not going to play the devil's advocate here. I'm totally comfortable with it. <laughs> I think Molly's absolutely right. I mean, Twitter has been... Twitter has been moving in this direction for a long time. Um, and it's just that their policies have been kind of ad hoc. Yeah. That they'll say, we'll ban you if you right. do X, and then you'll have two people doing X, and one will be banned and the other won't, and Twitter kind of throws up its hands and says, oh, we don't comment on individual accounts, so you sort of have no idea of what's going on. I think this is good in that it's a, it's a clearer policy. Yeah. Um, and they so far seem to be enforcing it semi-consistently, although there are examples of cases that we might dispute, such as Richard Spencer right. still being on Twitter. Right. I mean, I think what's really interesting about this is that you, you mentioned our president. Um, as, as Molly pointed out, um, Jada Franson, the leader of the far-right group whose tweets Trump retweeted, has been banned. Trump gets a lot of information from Twitter. And if there really is a purge of these far-right accounts, we could actually think of it as limiting the misinformation <laughs> that's reaching the president. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if Twitter should be thinking of that as a policy objective, but I also think that we shouldn't forget about it either. We have a comment from Seth who says, there is way too much racism and misogyny masquerading as free speech. Agree with that, Quinta? Yeah, I mean, I think Twitter, Twitter is a funny case because we talk about it in terms of the First Amendment, but it's a private company. You have no right to be on Twitter. Um, Twitter could ban anyone for any reason, and you would be able to do absolutely nothing about it. But we think of it in terms of the First Amendment. Because? Because it, it does play an outsized role in defining the debate in America, in other countries too. There are plenty of places for these other people to speak, but Twitter is a much larger platform. These people are going to Gab that's kind of fringy. You know, it's looking like the platform for the alt-right. Twitter is a platform for what everyone. What is it, Gab? Yeah. Oh, right? Yeah, it's, it's sort of, it was basically created as alt-right Twitter. Right. right, but Twitter's Twitter, and that's for everyone, and now these people are, some of them are not going to be allowed to be on there. Yeah, so. I have to say, I don't want that stuff on Twitter, and it makes me a little nervous, so whatever. We'll figure it all out. I think that gets us pretty much to the end of our time. Um, we are semi out of time, but we are not at all out of opinions, and it's only Thursday. If there's something you want us to discuss, let us know in the comments below. Until next time, we don't know when that's going to be. Could be next Thursday, could be after that. See you in 2017 or 2018. Um, <laughs> take care and um, tweet nicely. Bye. <laughs>